If I told you about a fringe sect that advocates for Israel's extinction, attends Holocaust denial conferences, and hangs out with terrorist groups, you'd probably think I was talking about radical Islamists or white supremacists. You probably wouldn't conjure up this image of Orthodox Jews. But that's exactly who I'm talking about. Meet the Detur Kauta, Judaism's fringiest, most extreme sect, whose warped theology has them rubbing shoulders with the worst enemies of the Jewish people. So here's the million dollar question. Why would any Jew, especially a religious Jew, oppose their own self-determination, jeopardize their own safety, and ally with anti-Semites against their own people? Disagreement amongst Jews isn't anything new. As the saying goes, two Jews, three opinions. Still, most Jews agree that Natura Kauta's opinions are beyond the pale. Make no mistake, even the most devoutly anti-Zionist Jews shy away from Natura Kauta's subversive tactics. Hold up, devout anti-Zionist Jews? Isn't that kind of an oxymoron? After all, if you're even remotely familiar with Judaism, you know that longing for Zion is embedded in our cultural and spiritual DNA. But for some Jews, there's a distinct difference between the Zion of our liturgy and the Zionism of Israel's founding fathers. And it's that gap between our prayers and our political reality that powers Natoya Karta's activism. Hold up, let me explain. Early Zionist leaders were mostly secular and largely concerned with the practical realities of building a state, a home for global Jewry. For them, spiritual liberation depended on the Jewish people's physical liberation. But devout Jews wrestled with the theological issues of building a Jewish state. And while many religious Jews saw a deep spiritual value in the establishment of a modern Jewish state, others disagreed strongly. See, religious Zionists believe that the creation of the State of Israel represents the first miraculous step in the coming of the Messianic era. But religious anti-Zionists, like the Natura Karta, think they've got it all wrong that only the Messiah can rebuild the Jewish homeland. In their words, we are in exile by divine decree and may emerge from exile solely via divine redemption. From the Torah Kauta's perspective, the Zionists who built the modern state of Israel more or less took God's job and made a mockery of it, building a secular state instead of a theocracy governed by Jewish law. To quote, again from a prominent anti-Zionist website, the modern state of Israel represents a pseudo-Judaism that has replaced a divine and Torah-centered understanding of our peoplehood. So the disagreement between Zionists and anti-Zionist Jews isn't just political, it's fundamentally religious. Because where Zionist Jews believe that the modern, man-made Jewish state is an overall net positive for the Jewish people, anti-Zionist Jews believe, well, the exact opposite. This ideological difference stems in part from an obscure discussion in the Talmud about the three oaths that govern the Jewish people's relationship with God. And while many Jews consider these oaths to be symbolic, anti-Zionist Jews see them as a religiously binding contract. Violate the first two oaths, and you violated your contract with God. Yikes. So what are these oaths anyway? Number one, once in exile, Jews are forbidden to return to their homeland en masse. Number two, Jews are forbidden to rebel against the governments of the countries where they live. Number three, the world's nations are forbidden to persecute Jews too harshly. So as political Zionism gained traction in the 20th century, some religious leaders motivated by the first two oaths formed anti-Zionist groups in response. By 1921, Jerusalem was home to two distinct Orthodox groups who worked closely to counter the Zionist influence. For a while, these anti-Zionist groups were a major thorn in the Zionist leadership side. They asked the British to rescind their support for the Zionist cause. They pledged their loyalty to the Jordanian king should he succeed in taking over the Promised Land. And they had some particularly fiery words for the Zionist counterparts. But everything changed in 1936 when Arab riots ripped throughout Palestine. Zionist paramilitaries, like the Haganah, did their best to defend the Jewish communities spread throughout the land. Still, hundreds of Jews were murdered, sparking a fierce debate among the anti-Zionist groups. Without the Zionist paramilitaries, the Jewish death toll would have been massive. So should the anti-Zionist groups start cooperating with the Zionists? For one small band of hardliners, the answer was a clear, hell no. It was these radicals who peeled off from the larger anti-Zionist community in 1938 to form their own splinter group. They called themselves the Natura Karta, Aramaic for the Guardians of the City. They held fast to their anti-Zionism throughout the entire Arab revolt which ended in 1939. They held fast through all of World War II as the Nazi war machine consumed one third of the world's Jews. For some anti-Zionists, the Holocaust was a turning point, a reason to believe in a national homeland. But for the Natura Karta, the Holocaust was a divine punishment for Zionism. 
The Jewish people had violated the first two oaths. They'd immigrated to Israel en masse. They'd rebelled against British rule. So God followed suit, no longer bound by the third oath to protect the Jews from harsh persecution. This is a rigid and uncompromising view of the world. One that I think most people would find pretty problematic. Still, it's not restricted to the Neturei Karta. There's at least one other anti-Zionist sect, Satma Hasidim, that believes that the Holocaust was divine punishment for Zionism. And yet, even that sect rejects the Neturei Karta. That's right, whether religious or secular, Zionist or anti-Zionist, the entire Jewish community thinks the Neturei Karta are insane. Because though theological disagreement is practically a Jewish tradition, selling out your fellow Jews to the enemy is not. But selling out their fellow Jews is the Neturei Karta's whole MO. As the world prepared to vote on the partition of Palestine, the Neturei Karta appealed to the UN Secretary General to rescue them from the Zionist regime. Despite the Neturei Karta's best efforts, Israel declared independence on May 14, 1948. Six Arab armies, including Egypt's and Jordan's, invaded the next day. Israel won that war, but shortly after the dust cleared, the Neturei Karta so-called foreign minister, Leib Weissfish, crossed into enemy territory hoping to petition the Arab League for weapons to fight against the Zionists. The Jordanians, to their credit, handed him over to Israel before he reached Arab League headquarters. But Weissfish set a dangerous precedent, and the Neturei Karta had made common cause with Israel's enemies ever since. Through the 1950s, the Neturei Karta tried repeatedly to make friendly contact with Israel's Arab neighbors. They finally succeeded in 1980, when Weissfish's successor, Moshe Hirsch, befriended PLO chairman Yasser Arafat. At the time, Yasser Arafat was public enemy number one. Under his leadership, the PLO orchestrated some of the most devastating attacks in Israel's history. Massacres of high schoolers and tourists and Olympic athletes, hijackings of buses and planes and cruise ships, the bombing of civilian targets. But Hirsch and the Neturei Karte more broadly saw real value in these repulsive photo ops with the PLO chairman. For one, their meetings made headlines, broadcasting the Neturei Karte's message to the world. But perhaps more importantly, Hirsch presented his cozy relationship with Arafat as proof that Jews could live and worship safely under Arab rule, negating their need for a sovereign state. This is the same twisted logic that powers the Neturei Karta's friendship with former Iranian President Ahmadinejad, with Hezbollah, with Hamas. And it's exactly why the Neturei Karta's ideology is so toxic, why even the most radical anti-Zionist groups think they're insane. The Neturei Karta weaponized their Judaism. Their appearance is their currency, and they wield it cleverly to present themselves as the real spokesmen of the Jewish people. And yet, the wider Jewish community understands that the Neturei Karta are nothing more than tokens, the pet Jews of enemy powers. Make no mistake, the groups that the Neturei Karta cozy up to are explicitly anti-Semitic. Their bombs and rockets and rhetoric do not differentiate between Zionists and anti-Zionists. But the Neturei Karta provide them with convenient cover, allowing the avowed enemies of the Jewish people to say, I'm an anti-Zionist, not an anti-Semite. It's a toxic and transparent tactic, but it works. Because if you didn't know anything about Judaism, and let's face it, most of the world doesn't, the Neturei Karta certainly looked the part. You'd come away thinking that they represented the world's Jews when they do nothing of the sort. They're selling out the Jewish people by lending a Jewish seal of approval to the vilest ideas, all while insisting that they're not a violent group, that they're working towards the peaceful dismantling of the Jewish state. It's a brilliant bit of trickery because the Neturei Karta don't need to call for violence. Their allies in Iran and Lebanon and Gaza are more than committed to doing their dirty work for them. So the next time someone trots out the Neturei Karta as evidence that Jews oppose Zionism, you'll know the truth. The Neturei Karta are Judaism's ideological rejects. And that's one thing all Jews can agree on.